path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> I mentioned last class that um, Feynman actually used uh, a consideration of a Markov process for a complex amplitude and managed to derive the Schrodinger equation. And here we're following a different route. We're assuming the Schrodinger equation, equation which automatically satisfies the Markov property in terms of the propagator. And then we're using that to um, we're using that to uh, show that one can construct a path integral formulation of quantum mechanics starting from the Schrodinger equation. So we had divided up the time interval from t0 to t in terms of a very large number n times intervals of size delta t. And then we're going to take the limit that delta t goes to 0 and n goes to infinity. And then we were um, allowing all possible kind of zigzag trajectories starting from the same initial point. You get the idea. And ending at the same final point. And this was represented by the quantum propagator. And so we had the propagator to xt from x naught t naught. So this is x naught and this is x. Is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. Of an n fold integral over a product of propagators over each interval of size delta t. So I find it always very awkward when you have commas in between symbols with subscripts. And this is a semicolon, of course. Um, <clears throat> I guess for completeness, I should write out each individual term. Let me just write it in terms of abstract indices, x prime, t prime. And xt is equal to m over i2 pi h bar delta t to the half exponent of i m x minus x prime. squared over 2 h bar delta t. So you recognize this as the momentum term. <clears throat> and then exponent of minus i v x <clears throat> delta t over h bar. So now we take the limit that delta t goes to 0 and n goes to infinity. And this justifies our approximation of saying that e to the i a plus b is equal to e to the i a 
VDIB because we have a little epsilon in front of there that's getting arbitrarily small. And then what we're also going to do, and this seems like you know black magic, but now we're going to recombine a product of exponentials into a sum again because now these are all just um, scalars. So basically we're gonna take I H bar <clears throat> sum over J equals zero to N of delta T minus V of X J. And this is going to Converge to, so here the, basically we interpret the uh, we interpret the sum as a Riemann sum, and so it becomes an integral. Now the key point is to the key point is to recognize that the object in the integrand is exactly the uh, this is the um, Lagrangian of classical mechanics. And the integral of the Lagrangian over the path is the classical action associated with, with the path. So the point is that in the delta t goes to zero limit, the quantum propagator can be understood as a sum over all possible classical trajectories. All classical trajectories that connect the endpoints, so that that satisfy the boundary conditions, and 
and each path gets a phase factor So we're summing over all trajectories, and each trajectory is going to be assigned a phase factor because this is a complex amplitude. And this phase factor causes interference between the paths. So you can have constructive or destructive interference depending on if the S for two different paths is the same phase factor or a different phase factor. So that attenuates the likelihood of that contribution. So finally, so Basically, so the final expression has a, has a, just applying substitutions from last lecture, the final expression takes the simple form An integral over all trajectories, and each trajectory is weighted by a phase factor, which is given by the action, the classical action associated with that path. <clears throat> now, I think it's a little bit misleading, maybe, to say it's a sum over classical trajectories, because lots of these trajectories, in fact, all of them but one is not classical. They're classical in the sense that they are a trajectory, but they're not classical in the sense that they are the solution you would get from solving the classical mechanical problem. So who remembers how to find the, um, how to use Lagrangian, where the Lagrangian comes from, sorry, where the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion come from in terms of variational calculus, sorry? Right, so you have a set of all trajectories and what you do is you find the trajectory for which the action is stationary and that's the distinguished classical trajectory. That's the, of all the possible trajectories you can, it'll take you from this boundary to this boundary, the classical solution is the one for which the action is stationary. And that's, that would be the classical trajectory which is deterministic. In the quantum setting, In the quantum setting, so maybe I should put scare quotes over classical. It should be all, all well-defined trajectories. Yeah. Off shells, yeah, that's a good way to put it, actually. Instead of classical here, I'm actually going to write possible. <clears throat> so there's yet an another... Another deep connection between um, quantum mechanics and classical mechanics there. And, um, and this is an equivalent formulation of, classical me of quantum mechanics. Now in practice, it's often hard to evaluate this integral analytically. I think there's only a few simple solutions, like the harmonic oscillator and things like that, where it works. So in practice, what you do is you actually look at the discretized form and evaluate it numerically. And of course it works. And it works as well as the resolution of your numerical discretization. So the smaller you make delta t, um, the better approximation you get to the exact quantum mechanical prediction. And so I guess this, the path integral formulation comes up in one of the future courses as kind of a central piece. Which, which course is it? Uh, quantum field theory two. Quantum field theory two. Yes. Where? Over here? There? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, let's see if that's self evident.
Okay. Yeah. Well, we're. Oh, does it go into the? It's, I didn't, um, I just, uh, I didn't work through the, I didn't work through taking the limit, I just used the result, and so I, I don't see offhand um, why that factor goes away. So I, off the top of my head, I don't see it. So it drops out for observable quantities. I see. OK. Are there any other questions? Okay, so, yeah, sorry, I didn't see you. Since seeing this equation, we basically just focused on the propagator itself. But is do we just propagate our back into the expression for psi, or is psi not even important anymore? Um, well, I think maybe the answer is the same as what Tibor was mentioning, which is that um, one typically uses it to calculate correlation functions. So you wouldn't, you could just drop reference to the wave function altogether, I assume, then. Well, the, I mean, Nicole's pointing out that. Um, the propagator originally appeared in an equation which was basically psi of x of t is equal to integral of g acting on psi of x naught t naught. And so we've stopped worrying about the wave function itself. Um, and so we just focus on, on, the, um, on the propagator. And is, is that the complete answer or is there something I'm missing in terms of Mm -hmm. so, the propagation itself won't go up because it's obliterated because it's just kind of integrated back to one of the double trees that you need to say each time you integrate back to one of the double trees. The square root of delta t? Yeah, so it's obliterated because the expression is just not going to have to be used for one Oh, I see, because you have delta t here. Yeah. When you do your Gaussian integral, it right. offsets the. Right. I guess you can see that because you have a delta T M. Okay. Because if you just think that the T just has the wave function with an initial position, it's the um, delta at the set of paragraphs. So, so normally you have your wave function and then you have an initial position. So you've got that thing in there. The, the T just has the initial position in the set of paragraphs. So it actually wants to always get to the Okay. So I think uh, in, in, in calculation terms, we need to be using the, 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 uh, uh, the 
it's uh, it's almost like the like the sort of uh, what we're uh, what we're looking at. So yeah. As it would have to be if it's an equivalent formulation of quantum mechanics. So, okay. So I'm going to move on to um, discuss um, discuss um, treatment of um, open quantum systems, and uh, this will tie into. question that was asked after last class about um, if the Schrodinger equation satisfies the Markov property, then how is it that we, and the quantum mechanics is the fundamental theory, how can we get non-Markovian behavior in everyday life? How is that even possible if the underlying theory is Markovian? And so I'll give an example of how that can arise. And the, one way that can arise if not the only way that can arise, is by um, not looking at the, the quantum description of the full system, but only looking at the quantum description of, a, of part of the system. And so it, by ignoring certain parts of the system in your description, that gives rise to a more general type of dynamical behavior of your, of your uh, system of interest. So here we imagine that we have a Hilbert space, which is comprised of, say, a system and some environment, which I'll just write with E. And to make things definite, let's uh, Let's do that. And then I think you went over in the tutorial the, uh, the Krauss picture. No, it was part of a homework assignment. It was part of a homework assignment. So anyways, let me just quickly recap uh, what's happening there. So you imagine that your initial state, or consider is a better word, consider an initial state. Uh, what form do I want here? that. Uh, we'll take the initial state to be um, rho tensor zero on the environment. And then we allow a unitary evolution on the combined Hilbert space. So we have our, our output state is equal to um, some unitary acting on rho s tensor zero. Here, I'll just drop the subscripts. The first left-hand side of the tensor product is the system. Right-hand side is the environment. And now, because the environment system is it's called an environment to denote the fact that we're only going to make observations on the system state, so the environment's inaccessible. And so while we can formally write down this evolution from the um, you know, axiom three of quantum mechanics, we want an effective description on the system alone. So then we want Rho S at Rho S out is equal to 
trace over the environment of u rho s So here I'm assuming the state of the environment is a pure state. Um, in principle, by including as much detail an environment as you want, you can, you can make it a pure state. So there's no loss of generality there. We have, you can just make n arbitrarily large. And now let's pick a basis for, we pick a basis for the environment. Um, let me call it little n. Actually, that's a bad, I call it j. To evaluate the trace, and then rho s out is equal to a sum over j, j, u, rho s, tensor 0, 0, u dagger, j. And now we can always um, insert a resolution of identity. here and there. And so we get two more sums. Sum over j, uh, sum over l, sum over k. And we get j, u, l, l, And then k so the 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 Dirac dual for L went right through rho s because it acts on the second system. And then this introduces delta functions, Dirac uh, Kronecker delta functions which that's k and l equal to zero. So then we have rho s out equals sum over j. j u zero rho s zero u dagger j. So then we define an operator a sub j as equal to j u zero. And then the important point to realize here is that because u, recall u is a matrix of dimension, um, I'll note this again, uh, u here is an element of, um, M, what is it? Mn times Mn. So what this notation means is that U is an Mn by Mn dimensional matrix, but J only varies from one to N because it's a basis only for the second system. So that means that Aj is then a matrix of dimension M by M. So this is a linear operator on the first Hilbert space. And then we have rho s out is equal to a sum over j, aj rho s, aj adjoint. And then as you probably did for your homework, you can easily verify that a sum over j of aj dagger aj has to be equal to identity to conserve um, probability. So to preserve normalization. 
trace of rho s equal to 1. Yes, so um, given any row in the linear operators on a d-dimensional Hilbert space, it is always possible to what's called purify row by finding some state psi, which is an element of a Hilbert space of dimension um, CD squared, I believe, such that trace, I'm going to write it this way, CD tensor CD, such that tracing over the second Hilbert space, let's, let's just call this HA tensor HB, so such that tracing over B of psi psi is equal to rho. Um, maybe this could be a proof done in the tutorial, or I could just do it right now. I could probably figure it out off the top of my head how to do this. We haven't decided on what should cover in the tutorial yet, so. <laughs> And that'll take up the, the full time? Okay, so I can just do this now. So, um, so how does this work? We want to, um, Okay, I don't remember off the top of my head, so I'm gonna we're, we're gonna leave this as an exercise for the. <laughs> I should remember this is it's actually quite easy. I just there's how to set it up is is uh, escaping me. Oh right. You know what I'll do for you guys, just uh, Ah, right. All right, so it's just using the Schmidt decomposition. So, we know that any mixed state can be expressed as a convex combination over some set of pure states. And then we construct a state psi on this larger Hilbert space in 
in the following way. And then you can verify that taking the partial trace will give you this density operator again. So first you find a, a decomposition um, as a convex combination of a set of pure states. And then you can use the Schmidt form to find the associated pure state. Yeah, so this could be any symbol here. Oh, it should be differently. Yeah, I don't, well, this is, I guess you can define this to be whatever you want, but. Okay, so um, this object here is called a, this is called a Krauss decomposition. And the operators AK are called Krauss operators. They're in general not unitary operators. So of course you can construct a generalized map for the subsystem S, uh, row S, by just taking a mixture of unitaries. So one possibility, one possibility, and this is just the kind of trivial possibility, is to take AJ equal to square root of PJ times UJ. And then this is just a mixture of unitaries. But that would be a very simple case. In much more general cases, the AJs are just arbitrary linear operators. And what the AJs represent is the fact that we have a unitary process, but it's a unitary process on a bigger Hilbert space of which we're only seeing part of it. And so the effective dynamics described at the system level, when you've kind of ignored that information, is um, is, is summarized in these, uh, in these Krauss operators. So an important assumption for this Krauss form, okay, so there's, there's a general theorem called Krauss's theorem, which is that um, a Krauss operator sum decomposition satisfying this constraint holds if and only if the map that takes rho, rho s initial to rho s out is a completely positive linear map, trace preserving linear map. So Krauss's theorem The evolution taking rho s in to rho s out admits a Krauss operator sum decomposition If and only if the map is um, only if the evolution is a completely positive trace preserving map which is often summarized as CPTP. So in general, people take this as an axiomatic starting point for open system mechanics. If you just want to think about quantum mechanics operationally, 
um, you would you would want to say, well, the most general transformation that can be applied to my density operator is a completely positive trace preserving map, and that corresponds to the case that I have some unitary transformation on some larger Hilbert space. So there's a number of useful results here, which I should mention. One is that um, any Krauss decomposition, given any Krauss decomposition, I can always find a unitary on the larger Hilbert space for which the partial trace of it via this rule gives that Krauss operator some decomposition. So there's a one-to-one -one course, sorry, it's not one-to-one, -one, uh, it's actually one-to-many. There's the, the, the purification of the Krauss, op, Krauss uh, given a Krauss decomposition, finding a unitary, the problem of finding a unitary on a bigger Hilbert space which provides that Krauss decomposition on the subsystem is non-unique. And you can see that because I can apply an arbitrary unitary to the environment and that won't change the action on the system. In other words, if I have this unitary couples the system and environment, but if after that unitary I apply some additional rotation on the environment alone, well by locality we know that uh, row out can't be affected. And notice that that's a different kind of locality than the Bell locality because if row out, if the state operator changes, that leads to a, 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 the possibility of signaling, right? The statistics change over here in a way that's controllable by someone in control of the environment. So that's a, um, it would be a, a stronger violation of locality than Bell's theorem if that weren't true. So one has a, a non-uniqueness in defining the unitary on the system environment. But given any such Krauss decomposition, you can find um, a unitary that implements that. So then we can think of, and then for every Krauss decomposition, we have a completely positive trace preserving map. And for every completely positive trace preserving map, we have a Krauss decomposition, which means we have a set of equivalences here between the set of completely positive trace preserving maps the set of Krauss operator decompositions, and sets of unitaries which implement that Krauss decomposition. And by sets, I mean I'm addressing this non-uniqueness, this fact that you can apply an extra unitary on the environment. Uh, yeah? Like, what does that mean? Sure. So uh, let's... Okay, right. So, so basically, if you have a map, um, let's just call it um, lambda, which takes density operators, um, density operators on the Hilbert space to density operators on the Hilbert space. So remember this notation D refers to non-negative operators with trace one which is a subset of linear operators, but also defines a basis for linear operators. So we could have equivalently thought of this as a, a map from linear operators on CD to lin linear operators on CD. So such a map is, um, so one, linearity. You all know what that means. So lambda of A row one plus B row two is equal to A lambda of row one plus B lambda of row two. Positivity means that if row in is a non-negative operator, then lambda of row in is also a non-negative operator. Complete positivity which, right, I, I was thinking this came up already and it came up in the context of, of um, when we were looking at the, um, the partial transpose condition as a condition for detecting entanglement. And I gave you a forward reference at the time, I said, 
it seems like a random thing that this partial transpose is a, is a map that's able to detect entanglement. And I said, we'll see later. The reason why it works is because um, it's not sufficient for a map to be positive and still be a physical map. It has to be completely positive. And let me just show you complete positivity and then I'll tell you that rest of that story. So complete positivity is the condition that if rho in tensor sigma is a non-negative operator, am I getting close to being too low? I'll switch over here. Let me just call it. If rho tensor sigma is a non-negative operator, then we demand lambda acting on the system tensor the identity super operator. So this is the identity map on density operators. So this whole object here produces some output state. Um, that should be non-negative. So remember, this is going to be a density operator on CD tensor. Let me just do it this way. CM tensor CN. So we're having, we're assuming the system has an, is an m-dimensional system and the ancilla system is a n-dimensional system. I don't know if you can read that because I don't. So what's the, the idea is this, if a map is positive, it's great because it takes input density operators to output density operators, which is what you want. You want to, the object that's the output of your map to still be a quantum mechanical state. But there exist maps which are positive, meaning that if you give them an input density operator, they give you an output density operator. But then when you trivially tensor them with some auxiliary system, which has no dynamics, the identity means you do nothing to that auxiliary system, and in fact, my notation here is poor. This shouldn't be right. This should be, this should be just some, um, some arbitrary state omega where omega is a density operator on CM tensor CN. So sorry, the way I wrote it down was actually missing the point because I was assuming the state was a product state. If it's a product state, then if the map is positive, the map tensored with identity will be positive too because basically it's trivial what we've done. So here what I'm saying is now allow some entangled state. If you have some entangled state between the system space and the ancilla space, and I act with the map on the system alone and do nothing to the ancilla, then the output state we require to be a, dense, a valid density operator. And so the curious thing is that there exist maps which are positive but not completely positive, which means they look positive when they act on a state which is a factorable state, but when you tensor them with identity and act on an entangled state, then they're no longer positive on that larger Hilbert space. And so complete positivity is the condition that for a physical map that um, even when, they, when you trivially tensor it with identity acting on an entangled state, you should still get a valid output. Yes. Yes. Well, that's what. The, so the fact that this is element of the density operators means that it's non-negative in trace one. Yeah. Thank you.
So given some input state omega that's, that's non-negative, um, and the fact that it's trace preserving is not so important. The important part is that it's non-negative. And so now we can go back to our discussion of the partial transpose, which was a way of detecting entanglement. So now we get an insight into why that was a good idea for detecting entanglement, because the transpose map, the transpose map is positive but not completely positive. So a partial transpose means I'm applying a transpose map on part of the system and doing nothing on the other part. So this would be a partial, if, if lambda was a transpose operation, then this composite action is a partial transpose. And because it's positive but not completely positive, it means that it will detect entangled states in the sense that the output won't be a positive state anymore. So that's, that's the insight of the perez horodeki criterion. So sorry for the forward reference two weeks ago, but this is the explanation for why that works. Yes? Yeah, no, so it's a partial criterion, which means it only detects some forms of entanglement. So there exists some entangled states which it can detect, but there are others which it can't detect. But if the dimensions are small, if this is 2 by 2 or 2 by 3, sorry, if this is 2 by 2 or 2 by 3, then it's necessary and sufficient. So what you find often in quantum information is people take um, the set of completely positive linear maps as defining the set of possible operations you can perform uh, on a quantum system. But there's an important caveat when you make that assumption. And it was, it was um, we made a simplifying assumption in the setup of this problem, which gave us the Krauss decomposition and which bought us complete positivity, and it's not always physically valid. So the set of completely positive trace preserving maps is actually not the full set of maps that can occur on your system. Does anyone know what the, the catch is? Yeah? Exactly. So we assume the initial state is a product state. And in fact, not only are we assuming it's not entangled, we're assuming it's not even correlated. So if you look at this expression, Our initial setup was that we had a factorable initial state between the system and the environment. If we allow classical correlations, so a probabilistic sum over distinct pairs, or if we allow entanglement, in both cases, uh, this, this argument breaks down. And we don't get a, a completely positive map. In fact, you don't, even get a, you don't even have to get a linear map. So you can actually generate nonlinearities by having an initial correlation between your system and environment. And then how is it nonlinear? Well, suppose the unitary acting on the system has different effects on the system depending on the environment state. So if you have rho S1 and do it this way. Rho S1 tensor 1 with probability P1 plus Rho S2 tensor 2 with probability P2 as your input state. And now you can have a unitary which say flips row one to an orthogonal state, flips the system to an orthogonal state if the environment is in state one, and does nothing if the environment is in state two. Then the action of that map, when looked at on the system alone, isn't even a linear map anymore. So, there's a kind of an open problem of understanding how to analyze that situation. And also, this gives us insight into uh, how you can have a, a, a process that doesn't satisfy the Markov property in spite of the fact that quantum mechanics is linear. Well, imagine a sequence of interactions where now we have this unitary 
which you know applies some transformation to the system if the environment state is in one state. But now you can also imagine um, A, a, a sequence of two or three operations in a row where information about the state gets stored in the environment state. And then, you know, three, um, three steps later, whether the environment is in this affected state or not, in turn affects what the future evolution of the system is. So in that way, you can have um, basically a non-Markovian process where the evolution of the system at a later time depends on um, some earlier evolution where the information of that was stored in some environment degree of freedom, which then came back and affected the system evolution later. So it can have a memory, you can have a memory effect. So basically, the key point here is that interactions with environment degrees of freedom allow for memory effects um, where the system state at an earlier time can affect the system's evolution at a later time. And these effects are generally called non-Markovian. It's called non-Markovian uh, noise often. Because usually these are, these are usually unwanted effects, but of course you can design systems to do this, but in practice, we often confront them in the context of trying, in the context of trying to do fault tolerant quantum computation, where you do error correction and try and, comp and, try and compensate for any noise effects. The presence of non Markovian noise is um, difficult, more difficult to deal with than the Markovian noise situation. Yes. Okay. We've been talking about class operators as completely positive fixed or serving maps, and we've seen why completely positive operators are useful. Um, but you said class operators are sort of simply, as in they're not the only useful fixed systems. Why are we focusing on them? What about the other completely positive? No, so the only uh, Cross's theorem. For the complete set of completely positive trace preserving maps, any one of them can be expressed in a cross operator decomposition, and every cross operator decomposition corresponds to a completely positive trace preserving map. So they're equivalent. And they both ignore the case where you can have initial correlations between your system and environment. So it corresponds to the setup where, which is the usual scientific setup, experimental setup, you have a system, you want to observe its properties. First thing you do is isolate that system from everything else, and then you can have a controlled situation. So it's a very natural paradigm to imagine that your system state is not correlated with anything else that's going to affect your experiments. But of course, inevitably these problems do occur because there are always imperfections and non-idealities. Yes? Yeah, so um, basically the idea is you have some system and it's coupled to some, what they call it a bath or an environment. And the environment can consist of, say, a whole bunch of zeros. You know, the environment might be in its ground state. 
And then you could have an interaction. So say at, at time, at each time Tn, some coupling occurs between the system and the first spin, and then the system, say, and the second spin interact. And that interaction allows you to flip spins. But you only flip the spin if the spin is in a zero state. And so there's a back action on the system. So, okay, the, the C, have you seen the C naught? Did that come up in a? Okay, so here, the simplest way to think about this is that the C naught operation, which is a matrix, of this form. So if we write our basis as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, then you can see the action of the C naught is to flip the second spin if the first spin is in the 1 state. So U C naught acting on the state 0, 0 does nothing. It just takes you to 0, 0. But you see not acting on acting on um, 1, 0. 1, 0, which is this state, is going to flip it to 1, 1. I guess I don't need a parenthesis. So the second spin gets flipped depending on the state of the first spin. So now what can happen is you can have a sequence of interactions which can um, cause some of the, well, I guess my notation is backwards, but you can conceptualize this. Imagine the environment is the first spin. Then if the environment is in the zero state, this interaction has no effect, and the system evolves as though the environment wasn't there, using this kind of a C naught, but with the order of the arguments reversed. But now if there's some interaction which flips one of the environment spins, caused by the system, then later on, when you interact with that spin again, it causes a, a flip of the system. So you can have this, um, basically the way, the, the kind of the way to conceptualize it is that um, the system can leave an imprint in the environment in the sense of changing its state. And then later on in a future interaction, this changed state of the environment causes a conditional action on the system and that conditional action wouldn't have happened if the environment hadn't been perturbed two or three steps ago. And so you can, so the basically information that was about the system gets stored in the environment and then later on in the time development that comes back and affects the system again. And so um, that's called a, a, a memory effect. And um, and uh, it's basically, that's what we mean by non-Markovian. So Markovian means there's no memory effects, and non-Markovian means there is. Think of the Markov property. We said that the probability of a transition was assumed to depend only on the current state and not on what the state was a few steps ago. And so that's exactly what can happen in this unitary picture. Why are we, why are we talking about 
in reference to Pastor Sarah Mas mapping became this thumb over the age of J's. Um, mapping became that to a unitarity, where, whereas I'm just thinking, where's the lambda in this equation? You know, that we have when you define oh. particular positives. Um, okay, so. Um, So here, sorry, I can have a unified terminology if I do this. A map lambda taking an input state to an output state, I guess I should use this symbol because it's not the set, but an instance from the set. Um, so a map taking an input state to an out, a map, let's define it as lambda, that takes an input state to an output state, admits a cross operator sum decomposition, which means that we can always write lambda rho as a sum over k, ak rho, AK dagger such that the sum over K, AK dagger AK is equal to identity. So a, a map of this taking input states to output states admits a Krauss operator decomposition, which is this. If and only if lambda is a completely positive trace preserving map. Is that clear? Sure. I uh, should have done it that way in the first place, actually. Um, I just hadn't introduced lambda yet, so I, I um, didn't. Yes. In the case of non-Markovian noise, what's the most general transformation that we can have? Are there any restrictions on the kind of transformations that we can have? I, I don't think the answer to that is known. It's an open question. People, I mean, there's been a handful of papers of people trying to struggle with what is the class of operations? The problem is they're nonlinear operations, and yeah, it's not known, but it's an interesting question. Okay, next I was going to discuss um, some applications of this formalism in the context of, uh, well, I was gonna look at some applications of the quantum formalism in terms of um, quantum control, so look at how do you, how can you generate some set of uh, scalar fields that allow you to manipulate, say, a two-level system or an arbitrary dimensional system to perform some prescribed unitary transformation? And was look at that in a setup, uh, which is uh, the same, essentially, the same mathematics for both the um, case of NMR and for uh, quantum optics, or more precisely driving a two-level atom with a, a laser field. And so basically it's the same mathematics for both those cases, so I was gonna go over how we do that. So you can see a concrete example. And time permitting, I can consider dissipation in that picture. One thing about this Krauss operator decomposition is that, and also when we talk about a map here, we're imagining some discrete time transformation. So we're saying, okay, well, we know that there's something more complex than a unitary that can happen to my system, and the, the framework we've looked at today is the context where we imagine there's some input time and some output time, and so we have discretized time, and we're looking just at a map that takes you the input state to the output state. There's a more general framework for looking at noise in a continuous time setup where just like the unitary, you have time as a, free as a continuous parameter, and there's a way to describe noise with a continuous parameter like that, which is called the Lindblad picture. And um, I guess I m might also include that Lindblad description in the, the framework of experimental control of a two-level system because it's the relevant way to model the noise. The problem with the Lindblad picture, well, not the problem, but the Lindblad picture only works if the noise is Markovian. And so it's, it's uh, restricted to that, that framework, but it's still a very, broad, a very broad class of noise models fall into that framework, so it's still quite useful. Okay, thanks for your attention, and I'll see you tomorrow.